Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to learn about this intriguing corner of our wonderful state. I'm Mark Darnell, photographer, desert explorer, public lands owner, just like you, and today I'm going to be your virtual tour guide. We will take a little trip to see this remarkable part of our state that has these rarely seen natural wonders on your public lands. This part of the state has cast a spell on me, and today I hope you will feel the enchantment too. We're going to visit Summer Lake and Winter Rim, Abert Lake and Abert Rim, Hart Mountain, Steens Mountain, the Pueblo Mountains, and the Owyhee River Canyon. For those who have never been there before, I hope you'll be inspired to get out there. And if you have been to these places, I hope you'll be inspired to go out and explore even further. Okay, let's get started. First, we'll get our bearings with some maps, geology, and info on our public lands. Then, a bit about inspiration to search for the remote but beautiful lands. The video tours. Here is where the tours take flight and land. The first and second humans is a quick recap of human activity in Southeast Oregon. Your public lands today will, re will reveal the importance of our public lands. Okay, let's see where these areas are on the map. To get your bearings, here's Bend, Burns, Idaho's over here. Of course, Nevada, California's down here. This part of our state is full of dramatic basin and range landscapes. For example, Winter Rim is a mountain range and Summer Lake is a basin right beside it. More on basin and range geology in a minute. Exploring these remote areas can be challenging due to minimal visitor services and the lack of paved roads. But once you put the puzzle pieces together, you will be glad these challenges are what keeps the region from being overvisited. Well, to access Summer Lake, which is here from Bend, usually you would come down Highway 35 from Lapine. The small community of Summer Lake has a store, restaurant, and motel rooms. Here you can explore winter rim hiking, birding at the wildlife refuge, and soaking at the Summer Lake hot springs. The more adventurous can head east on desert jeep trails into the Alkali Dunes and explore Diablo Rim. Paisley, population 240, is a small ranching town that is two years older than Bend. It has a store, motel, and restaurants and provides a good base for exploring Summer Lake and Abert Rim. The historic Pioneer Saloon is home to a wooden bar that was made in the late 1800s in Boston, shipped to San Francisco, and freighted by wagon overland to Paisley. Abert Rim is a wild place with no facilities, but the highway by the lake provides dramatic views and access to the public lands along the lake and rim. The Shewakan River comes out of the mountains and drains into briny Abert Lake. 15,000 years ago, Summer Lake and Abert Lake were joined into one huge lake called Lake Shewakan, which has dried up since the end of the last ice age. The tiny ranching town of Plush, population 63, has a store, but no real accommodation for visitors. But there are a few small campgrounds in the area. There's a lot to explore in Warner Valley and beautiful Hart Mountain, including the National Antelope Refuge and a Hot Springs campground. Now, a trip to Steens Mountain right here is usually done by coming south from Burns on Highway 205 to French Glen, population 12. This small town has a store and a, and, a, and a historic hotel and is named for Peter French and Dr. Hugh Glenn, early cattle barons in this valley. It provides access to great birding in the Mallory Wildlife Refuge and to the gravel road that goes all the way to the top of Steens Mountain and to the edge of the escarpment with unforgettable views. On the east side of Steens is the town of Fields. 
Fields has a population of 120, although I've only seen about six or seven houses in town. It has a store, a few rooms, and a small RV park. Fields provides access to explore the Alvord Desert and the east side of Steens Mountain, and also the Pueblo Mountains down here. In the far southeast corner of our state, outside of the Basin and Range region, is the Owyhee River Canyon. To reach this area, you would normally take Highway 78 out of Burns towards Rome. Rome, uh, population 180, although I've never seen any houses in Rome. Rome has a store and a few cabins and is the only place where a paved road crosses the river. Jordan Valley, a larger town just off the map over here, has accommodations for travelers and is a good base for exploring the Uwaihi. But exploring across the Uwaihi Plateau out to the edge of the River Canyon, like anywhere in here or here, that is really challenging. There are only a few all-weather gravel roads and a lot of seasonal dirt roads, so a lot of long, bumpy, muddy roads and overland hiking may be involved for serious explorations. Now, how did these giant basin and range landscapes get here? Well, the Earth's crust in southeast Oregon is in motion. This corner of our state is slowly being pulled apart as the North American plate generally moves west, and, and a part of our state is rotating at the same time. As the cru Earth's crust is pulled apart there, it allows titanic crustal blocks to separate and tilt over, forming the basins and ranges side by side. Then the exposed ranges erode and the basins fill with water. During the last ice age, the climate was much wetter and the basins filled with lakes about 200 feet deep. Since the ice melted about 12,000 years ago and the climate dried, the giant lakes have dried up to their present size. Now look at this, the vertical displacement of the Steens Thrust Block Mountain from the top here to the Alvar Desert is about five to 6,000 feet. This thrust block began its rise about 9 million years ago and continues to this day at an average rate of 1 one hundredth of an inch per year, which doesn't sound like much, but through the power of geologic time, that is 833 feet of rise per million years. Because of Steen's great height of about 9,700 foot elevation, which is 700 foot higher than Mount Bachelor, it is the only thrust block mountain in Oregon to have been glaciated resulting in five dominating gorges on the mountain. How about that? Glaciers in the middle of the desert. Well, I bet you didn't know you were rich, but you are. Look at how much land you own. This entire tan corner of our state is public land, your public land. It's managed by the Bureau of Land Management, and it is ours to use for now. It's full of natural treasures. Every gem you will see today, you own. But for how long? How much of this public land is actually protected against development, extractive uses, and degradation? Uses that most of us would abhor. Well, you would probably think Oregonians would have a strong wilderness ethic, right? But take a look at how much of our state is actually legally protected by the wilderness designation. It's just these dark green forest areas and three bright red areas in the desert. This is the Badlands Wilderness by Bend. A tiny dot up here is the Spring Basin Wilderness. And then you've got part of the Steens Mountain Complex down here which, by the way, those three desert wilderness areas, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to the Oregon Natural Desert Association for spearheading efforts to preserve those areas. And you can see that compared to our neighboring states, we have only one third to one half of the protected wilderness areas that they have. We have some serious catching up to do. Now, these dark red areas are wilderness 
study areas or WSAs. They have temporary protection for major development, but only until the BLM and corporate pressures decide otherwise. As the owners of these wilderness study areas, we must insist on permanent protection for these incredible, fragile, irreplaceable desert lands for the enjoyment of all of us. Visiting our dramatic public lands in Southeast Oregon can be an inspiring experience for everyone. My own inspiration starts with the search for the most beautiful vistas and leads me to some of our wildest places where I frequently go off trail in search of a unique perspective. After reaching a remote, grand scene, often alone, I watch the sunrise or sunset slowly unfold in front of me as if I am the only human on earth witnessing creation itself. While waiting for the shifting clouds and light to paint the scene to perfection, I have ample time for resounding solitude and reflection, and I slowly perceive the immense natural forces and vast geologic time scales that created the beautifully sculpted scene before me. In these moments, I am overcome by the majesty of nature. These are the moments I try to capture and share. Right after I started exploring remote Southeast Oregon, I joined ONDA, the premier desert conservation organization. At first, my journeys were motivated by the desire to get a desert photograph published in the beautiful ONDA calendar. But as I continued to explore, something much larger happened. I discovered that these vast, open, mesmerizing lands full of titanic Natural sculptures gave me powerful, soul-filling experiences. I began to understand the importance of preserving these wild places. My motivation shifted from searching for beauty to sharing the beauty, because the more that people care about these places, the better chance we have at protecting them. All right, this is what you've been waiting for. The journey begins. We'll fly in and explore each of the six areas. While on his Oregon Country Expedition, Lieutenant John Fremont was marching through the snow and on December 16, 1843, arrived at the edge of a daunting precipice. Overlooking the warm, dry lake basin below, he bestowed the names Winter Rim and Summer Lake to the contrasting features. One of the hidden gems you will see is a towering white rock outcrop on Winter Rim known locally as the Pale Face. The summit of Winter Rim stands over 3,000 feet above Summer Lake. Let's fly there.
named for Colonel J.J. Abert, Fremont's boss in the Army Topographical Engineers, precursor to the Army Corps of Engineers, this briny lake is all that is left from ancient Lake Shewakan, and it continues to wither. The Abert Rim WSA along the lake and rim provide public access to this amazing escarpment, which stands 2,400 feet above the lake. Let's go. The Warner Mountains and Warner Valley were named for Captain William Warner of the Army Topo Engineers, who was tasked with finding, finding a military wagon road route in the 1860s from the Columbia River to the Great Salt Lake. The many scattered lakes in the Warner Valley are the last remnants of the ancient 200-foot deep lake that covered the entire valley. Hart Mountain is home to a national antelope refuge and a primitive hot spring campground, as well as many beautiful canyons. Warner Peak stands 3,500 feet above the valley floor. Let's fly there.
Steens Mountain and Alvord Desert. This is the Big Daddy in the Basin and Range region. First called Snow Mountain by early explorers, it eventually was named for Army Lieutenant Colonel Enoch Steen, who also explored the area to locate a military wagon road. Steens is the only thrust block mountain high enough to have developed glaciers, and we'll see their handiwork in Kiger Gorge, Wild Horse Canyon, Big Indian Gorge, and Little Blitzen Gorge. Let's go.
South of the Steens lies this little visited mountain range, but the colorful lichen-covered rocks, abundant wildflowers, and variety of terrain are stunning. Pueblo Ridge appears as a tilted thrust block mountain, while Pueblo, Pueblo Mountain is separated from the ridge across a small valley. The only real road through the area is a dirt road that crosses Pueblo Ridge at Domingo Pass. Let's go there. The Owyhee River Canyon. Finally, we leave the basin and range lands for a trip to our last hidden gem, the Owyhee River Canyon. The river has sculpted and carved wondrous works of art, creating a huge swath of canyon lands out of a flat upland plateau. This Grand Canyon of Oregon is truly a hidden gem, hidden from view, except to the most adventurous explorers who can reach the canyon rim or raft down the river or join us on this tour.
Wow, right? Are these some dramatic and beautiful places or what? But can you imagine for a minute being the very first human being to see these dramatic landscapes? Well, that actually happened about 15,000 years ago when the very first humans crossed the Bering Land Bridge and migrated down the western interior of North America all the way to the southern tip of South America. Right across the southern part of southeast Oregon. Some stayed in southeast Oregon and over thousands of years evolved into the Paiutes and the Shoshone peoples who lived there, hunted there, and raised their families there. They felt deep reverence for the land, a spiritual connection to the land. They were a part of nature, not above nature. They felt the land could not be owned by humans. Instead, they believed the land belonged to their creator, who generously provided the bounty of the land to them. So they acted as good stewards of the land. For 500 generations, the Paiutes and Shoshones lived there in balance with the ecosystem without causing any significant degradation. Not so much with the second wave of humans to arrive in southeast Oregon about 200 years ago, the Euro-Americans, who had little reverence for the land, but instead had a burning desire to own the land and extract its resources at all costs in a rush to build wealth and eventually build our society into, into today's globally interdependent industrial machine. which clearly explains why the last generation of free Paiutes and Shoshones were willing to fight to their death to stop the plundering of the land by the Euro-Americans. Chief Palina was a brilliant war chief who roamed widely across southeast Oregon defending his traditional hunting grounds from ruin until a bullet finally found the chief that bullets could not touch. Has no horse worked hand in hand with Polina to lead highly skilled war parties in defense of their territory in southeast Oregon until his death in a Nevada jail in the 20th century. Sarah Winnemucca became an educated woman, and she spent her life not fighting the settlers, but trying to negotiate a peace between her people and the land grabbing Euro Americans, but to no real avail. The early years of settlement changed the ecosystem on our public lands due to mining, overhunting, and livestock overgrazing. But we are extremely fortunate to still retain vast areas of wild, rugged, and hauntingly beautiful landscapes in our public treasury. But you must go there and check on your natural treasures. Go there and find freedom and escape from the constant hum of our modern beehive-like society. Go there, meditate, be in the present moment, and restore your perspective on what is important in life. Go there, let nature overtake your senses, reconnect with the land, marvel at nature's artworks millions of years in the making, and find your own spiritual sanctuary. But above all, we must rediscover the first human's deep reverence for the land, we must realize that it has inherent value as is, regardless of its commercial value. This realization is the key to changing our behavior toward our land so that we will stand up for the land to save and protect our Southeast Oregon public lands. And in fact, to save our very planet. John Muir said it best, everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. Well, thank you for tuning in today. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this trip and I hope you get out there soon. There's plenty of space for us to space out. And I wanna thank the library for hosting this presentation. If you would like to contact me, please go to my website 
and send me an email through there and there will be more contact information on the next slide. Thank you again. Bye-bye.